What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're engaged, and we like to get scared together. Yeah. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna head off comments at the pass. My ring is in the shop. So oh. I'm not wearing it. Yeah. I just know people are going to be annoying about it. <laughs> they always are. I'll tell the story like real quick in case you don't follow me on Instagram. So James proposed with my great grandmother's ring, which I had picked because I literally found it in a box in my basement a few years ago and just fell in love with it. But it needed a ton of work done because it's about 100 years old. It's Art Deco. It's really cool. But so we had it restored restoration wasn't great it yeah it it came out okay so we brought it to another place that specializes in antique jewelry and they looked at it under a microscope and stuff and they were like yeah this thing's gonna fall apart in like five years (laughs) like there's so many micro cracks and I guess just little rips in the metal that you can't really notice with the naked eye so they suggested remaking it so they're doing like a complete scan of it so it's going to look identical to how it would have looked back when it was made and i won't have to worry about constantly getting it repaired because it's old so i'll get to keep the original but i'm gonna have a new one but you don't have it now i don't have it now so don't be weird about it please (laughs) yeah it doesn't matter don't be weird about it cool so this week we <laughs> are talking about Little Shop of Horrors. Lucy's here. Hi, Lucy. Yeah. She. We just got back from visiting James's family in Florida and going to Orlando's Halloween Horror Nights. Mm-hmm. So Lucy's very happy that we're back. <laughs> Bye, Kitty. But we're we're gonna talk about the original Little Shop of Horrors, 1960, not the musical at not the 80s version with rick moranis although i love both the musical and the movie version of the. i love any iteration of little shop i always conflate those two in my head i mean they're they're the it's a filmed version of the musical is the the musical one right but that's not the rick moranis one or is the rick moranis one a musical it's the musical yeah oh you know you know what i'm conflating in my head is the musical version of uh, Reefer Madness that came oh, out in like the early 2000s with, with I think, Kristen, Kristen Bell. Bell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'd be a fun one too because that's another thing where it's like a musical remake of an old movie. Yes. Although that original movie was like a propaganda film, yeah. which is hilarious. It's weird because I've seen the original movie <laughs> yeah. like a bunch because I would watch it with my friends in high school, mm-hmm. but I have never seen the... Oh, the musical? Mm-mm. Oh, we should give that a shot. I bet that would make a good double feature with the Rick Moranis Little Shop of Horrors. That would, that would be a lot of fun. Although doing that would just further conflate them in my head, so yeah. I don't know if that's a good idea. Yeah. But yeah, this is I, I find it interesting that some people, I think, aren't aware that this exists. Yes, we brought this up with, I think we were talking to your mom, mm-hmm. and she didn't know this existed. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that Little Shop did not begin its life as a musical. It was a movie first. It was a B movie. Yeah. And this movie, I, I think it's hilarious that it's as big as it is. It's so everyone knows Little Shop. The concept, the story, everyone well, knows. Feed me, Seymour. Yeah, and Audrey too. Although in this, she's or she, she, I guess a she. Yeah. Oh, usually played by a dude, but <laughs> Audrey Junior mm-hmm. in this iteration. But yeah, this was a B movie. I think it got a lot of popularity because it was played on TV a bunch. So this is a Roger Corman movie, and if the plot of Little Shop seems familiar, oh just God. the vibe of Little Shop seems familiar, you might recognize it being. Pretty much the same as Bucket of Blood, which you covered on the Kill Count. Yes, Bucket of Blood was 1959. It was that movie starring Dick Miller, which mm-hmm. I covered in honor of the late great character actor who's in this movie. He to, is in this to movie. To further drive home those similarities. This movie came out a year later in 1960 and was actually, wasn't it filmed like back to back? Yeah, so I think it, I think the story of this movie is a little weird because some people say, oh, uh, Roger Corman had a bet that he couldn't film two movies in this amount of time. But I think that's more of like a 
like a cutesy idealistic story about why this movie exists basically from my understanding this exists because roger corman famously uh how do i phrase it thrifty just he (laughs) frugal he liked to save money where he could yeah. When he was making him, and I say I'm speaking in past tense, but that he's still alive. Yep. Just Lest don't... you forget. Is he still making stuff? I would that would be crazy if he was, but I wouldn't be shocked. I think he's still active and like does appearances, maybe. Yeah. I don't know, because I think when I interviewed uh Joe Dante last year, oh, who, they're who close. was a protege yeah, of Roger close. Corman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he came out of the Corman school of filmmakers. Mm-hmm. He he had mentioned, yeah, Corman's still doing stuff, and he had just talked to him. Corman, I think, is 95. He's old, yeah, yeah. Jimmy Carter age? Yeah. Yeah, way up there. <laughs> Again, I mentioned this on Twitter, but Roger Corman, not verified on Twitter. Oh, yeah, that's Blue right. check marks mean nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's so funny that Joe Dante inherited Dick Miller from Roger Corman. Dick yeah. Miller was like this weird family heirloom that was passed down the generations. And I mean, even in this movie, you have Jackie Joseph playing uh, Audrey in mm-hmm. this movie, and she winds up in Gremlins and Gremlins 2 as Dick Miller's wife. She's married to Dick Miller, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love it. It is really cool how once you start digging into Roger Corman movies, Joe Dante movies, it's just all the same people over and over and over again. But anyway, so back to this movie being made, I think what happened is, so Corman makes Bucket of Blood in 59. Mm-hmm. And he comes in under budget and behind schedule. Or no, ahead of schedule. Yeah. What I mean is behind his due date, sure. rather. So he, which is great. That's the <laughs> ideal for any filmmaker, but especially him. I think for him, that's the goal with every movie he makes. <laughs> so I think this one, he's like, oh man, we have all this extra time and money. So he turns to his writer, Charles B. Griffith, who wrote Bucket of Blood, and is like, hey, could you just come up with something We'll use all the same sets from Bucket of Blood. We basically have everything here. We might as well just turn out another movie. And I think on top of that, the laws concerning um, rights to appearances for actors was going to change in, I think, 1960 or 61. So it would have been... So now when you make a movie, whenever, uh, you know, you, you play a movie somewhere, the actors in it get paid. You... They are paid royalties for their appearances. And I think the laws about that were about to change in, yeah, early 60s. And Corman realizes that's going to be a lot more expensive for him in the future. So he decides to crank out one last movie where he doesn't have to worry about these extra fees that are (laughs) about to be implemented. So they churn out Little Shop of Horrors and they film it in two days, which is insane. It's basically filmed like a multicam sitcom now that I think about it. Yeah, a lot of long shots of just people talking. And mm-hmm. that's not a disparaging remark. The dialogue's really funny. Yes. Just like Bucket of Blood, there's some humor that still is oh, funny today. They're both both those movies are so funny. And I think a lot of it is kind of improv. It all it sounds like everyone involved has the same memory of it and that it it was just we just cranked out this weird movie and a lot of it was just made up as we went along. But it seems like everyone had really fond memories of it. But that is why the plot of Little Shop is basically Bucket of Blood because I guess why fix so it's not broken? Dude, it's the same fucking movie. And my <laughs> one of my favorite bits of trivia is that the score done by Fred Katz, yeah, that you were like, oh, this sounds like Bucket of Blood, that kind of jazzy score, mm-hmm. especially during that chase scene. It is the same score. It's just the same music. It's the That's literal so same music. And I don't know how true this is because it sounds like too good of a mm-hmm. an anecdote to be true, but apparently Fred Katz would just resell the score to <laughs> Corman. <laughs> I think some people claim Corman doesn't even realize it's the same yeah. thing. He already owns it. But it is literally the same score dropped on top of this movie. That's and great. this movie was such a whatever to the point where Corman doesn't even file the right paperwork. It's the same. It's a, it's a Night of the Living Dead, Dead situation where this film ends up in the public domain. And boy, I can't imagine how upset Corman was when this thing starts getting big. Right. Why couldn't they have made a musical of Bucket of Blood? <laughs> I think they did. 
Do they really? But it did not go well. Ah, yeah. that's a shame. <laughs> I forget I, who played in it, but like a big actor played in the musical of Bucket of Blood. I will say out of the two movies, and I'm trying to kind of dissociate Little Shop 1960 from Little Shop, the concept and the musical and everything else. I think I like Bucket of Blood more. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, what makes you say that? I think- uh, Interesting. I think the humor of it just got me more. I like more Dick Miller always. Yeah. I love having Dick Miller be the lead. Not that uh, is it jo- uh, Jonathan Hayes, I almost called him Joseph. Jonathan Hayes as Seymour is also wonderful. It's a very Dick Miller role, though. It is. It's ve- it was written for Dick Miller. Oh, yeah? He he was asked to play Seymour because, fuck it, we're making Bucket of Blood again. Why didn't he go for it? Um, I don't know. He just was like, nah. I, I, I honestly think he just wanted to play something different. Yeah, because he's in this movie as it looks like fourth build, which uh, you know, you have you have Seymour who works at the flower shop, his boss, and Audrey who also works there, and they're like the three leads. Mm-hmm. And then right after them is Dick Miller, who's this random yes. flower shop patron who eats flowers. They are all right. Well, I've had better. Well, this is a small shop. Oh, well, that's okay. You know those big places; they're full of pretty flowers, expensive flowers. When you're raising for looks and smell, you're bound to lose some food value. I like to eat these little out of the way places. And the first time it happens, it, it's so random. I thought it was going to be a one off, but no, yeah, that's no, his character. That's his fucking character. Is he, he's always looking for the tastiest flowers, and it's so absurd. Yeah. You can't <laughs> eat carnations. Like, there are a lot of flowers you can eat. You can put yeah. them in salad and stuff. But he's whipping out his salt shaker mm-hmm. and seasoning them and just biting into I just a caught me so off guard bouquet. the first time he just chomped right into yeah, that Yeah, it's pretty funny. And, yeah. But it's so weird how that just... No, that's a thing in this movie. It's not a one-off visual gag. That's his character. And I remember when I was looking at the Wikipedia for this before... Because I think I'd seen this version so long ago like I don't remember any of it Mm -hmm. but I have memories of watching it as a kid but looking at the Wikipedia I was like who is Dick Miller playing it must be just kind of a weird side character because it's not a character in the musical but no he's a pretty big character it's just they don't have him in the musical they change it up a little bit oh yeah so yeah yeah, Dick Miller's character is not in the musical no eating flowers or not so I thought oh he's gonna be some kind of minor character just like a one scene type thing no he's hanging around the whole time Mm -hmm. spitting out dialogue that's really funny yeah this movie is very funny I think Roger Corman movies are so funny in a way that other stuff is not that <laughs> came out around that time like yeah. mid I think um like mid-century style humor is for the most part just so fucking lame and <laughs> not funny to me but this movie and its sense of humor is kind of a like it's referred to as sick humor like quote unquote sick humor was a style in like 50s and 60s and so we're getting into mad magazine mm. lenny bruce who is <laughs> like if you think of like bob hope as mainstream 50s very wholesome everyone's grandma loves bob hope then you have lenny bruce who is like the edge lord comedian <laughs> of the 50s i honestly 50s? would Lenny Bruce was maybe sixties. Okay, I feel like probably sixty. I don't know. I don't know my. Uh, Lenny I don't. Bruce I don't you know well enough to say the years here is it. But like fifties and sixties is the era I'm yeah. talking about. This very pure area mm-hmm. before we have our cultural revolution. But yeah, I was trying to think of a modern analogy like Bob Hope is to Lenny Bruce as blank is to blank. But I honestly couldn't think of anyone or any because. I don't think there's anyone like Lenny Bruce because now it's in vogue. Like, I think it is the status quo to be vulgar. It's the status quo to talk about things that are not considered polite. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's comedy now. So I don't know if there's anyone I could. I think he was, you know, he's his own thing. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, maybe uh, uh, Bob Hope to Lenny Bruce is... um uh the the mistaken perception of bob saget to actual bob saget yes no oh my god that's that's it yeah that's the yes i I think that's the most dead you nailed it absolutely yeah if you're a fan of full house (laughs) and you've never listened to bob saget stand up go listen to it (laughs) it's super wholesome and family friendly (laughs) go watch go watch the documentary the aristocrats oh god (laughs) 
as far as this being the same movie as Bucket of Blood, you have a put-upon guy who wants to be successful in his field, isn't, kind of berated by the person in charge of him, Mm -hmm. finds a a shortcut to success in the form of either death as art or a death-causing plant, begins to mistakenly feed into that and get in over his head, finds success with that, uh, the boss finds out about it and is suspicious, but doesn't doesn't reveal because it's bringing him success as well. And then they both culminate in a big chase scene where that person is being chased by a bunch of cops and it's just like jazz music playing. It's they're very they're so similar. Yeah, ultimately resulting in his death in the form of his the thing that made him famous. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. They're so similar. Yeah. They're very similar. Mm-hmm. They even have the love interest is the uh, taller, <laughs> pretty woman who works alongside him and who finds interest in him after he begins to find success. Mm-hmm. But it's always been nice to him. Yeah. 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 They're they're not like oh they were mean and didn't care about him until he got famous. They've mm-hmm. always been they're like they're nice characters. Yeah, and in this movie, Audrey I think gets a little bit more to do because she's like a uh, kind of an airhead character. Yeah, she gets she gets to be funny. Yeah, and she, uh, she has a running thing where she uses the wrong word. Yeah, in place of things. My favorite one of hers, I wrote it down, was she says, "I'm so hungry, I could eat a hearse." Yeah, that one's good i like that she uh presents a cesarean salad yes a cesarean <laughs> salad yeah instead of a caesar salad i like all the wordplay in this it's very funny mm-hmm. yeah er- even early on you just get like pretty standard joke setup delivery with uh mushnik who is the boss at the the little shop of horrors who's a very like stereotypical jewish character but i believe that the actor is jewish the actor's jewish i think roger corman's Uh, One of his parents and grandparents were Jewish. So I think it's like one of those things where it's done out of affection for like Jewish culture. Uh, Not that I can say anything because I'm not Jewish, but he's like talking to uh, a customer who's asking for a cut rate. And he's like, oh, like a cut rate. I to my throat I would be giving a cut. Yeah. <laughs> Just like wordplay like that is yeah. really fun. Oh, Mr. Mushnick. <laughs> yeah, I love Mushnick. <laughs> I know, I do too. He's such a dick, but that's why we love him. <laughs> I love too that like going back and watching this after being so familiar with the musical, realizing how much of the musical songs and the wordplay in the songs and the songs titles are taken from this like, like from the, the dialogue yeah like the whole scene where he starts calling seymour his son that's oh, a whole yeah. song in the musical oh, okay yeah how would you like to be my son do, 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 do. <laughs> how would you like to be my own adopted boy i know the whole fucking musical like, yeah right, i'm not it. that familiar yeah. with it but oh also heads up if you want to watch this you can watch yes. it on YouTube. Watch it on YouTube for free. I'll put the link in the description. Do, do, do. <laughs> <laughs> we watched it on Amazon. Also for quote unquote free. It comes along with an Amazon Prime subscription. Uh, but the version on Amazon is a big old piece it of shit. It looks like shit. Yeah. We watched this whole version. I'm thinking, oh, it's a low budget Corman thing. It looks like garbage. Yeah, like the transfer will just always look like this. Yeah, Everything's it's, washed it's super out. super blown out. The and... dentist scene looks like a couple of ghosts. Yeah. Just, they're just entirely blown out and, and white. So then I go and look on YouTube because I think there was a clip I wanted to watch again and... I see, oh, someone's uploaded the whole movie and it is a beautiful transfer. Some random person put online. What the fuck, Amazon? I'm sure the Blu-ray looks good like that. Oh, I'm sure. You know, because like the Blu-ray for Bucket of Blood looks great. Yeah. But the the Amazon version. Where the fuck did they get that? That's bullshit, man. Man. Yeah, I can't believe we watched that whole movie. Not that it's a long one. This one is fucking 72 minutes. This is such a (laughs) case for like the fear of only having access to stuff via streaming services. Oh, yeah. This is the kind of stuff that freaks me out because what if that person didn't upload their physical copy of this? Then we would have just only been able to see it looking like shit on Amazon. I mean, I'm always against the like people who are like, you don't need physical media. The bit rate through streaming services are they don't match. Like, yeah. watch any Netflix show. the The blacks in the picture oh, are all crushed, are all and blocky. Terrible. No yeah. matter what connection you have or TV you have, it looks poopy. Get a mm-hmm. Blu-ray. 
Yeah, but it, that that's the kind of stuff that freaks me out is the idea of this a quality upload or a quality version of something being lost forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's no good. Uh, I, I kind of want to go through the cast of this. Um, sure. Because I think the cast is really interesting. I mean, it's so many like Roger Corman's stable actors, but we have Jonathan Hayes as Seymour. Again, yeah, a very Dick Miller performance, but he is so cute and perfect in this. I love him as Seymour. Uh, he is currently 90 years old. He's still alive. Yeah. He's most known for this, but he acted in a lot of other Corman stuff, and I think he worked in production a bit, but this is like what he is known for. And often when you hear, oh, someone is most known for like one thing in their youth i don't i I think maybe we get the idea that they're embarrassed by or something you know where it's like oh that kind of sucks for them that it's just this one thing but it sounds like the people in this really embrace it and really love their roles to the point where the actor who played mushnick mel wells who let me see he again most known for this uh, he performed the role of Mr. Mushnick in a community theater production. He decided, you know what? I'm going to be Mr. Mushnick in the musical because it's my role. So he is in this community theater version of it. And Jonathan Hayes, who again played Seymour, came to see it on opening night. And I just, <laughs> I don't know. That just really, I, I thought that was the sweetest little anecdote. Yeah. So it's it seems like there was a lot of love that came out of this and it's really nice. Jackie Joseph is Audrey. She is currently 85. And she, yeah, she, again, yeah, we mentioned this, married to Dick Miller and Gremlins 1 and 2. She also, a little bit later in life, she started an organization for uh, celeb wives dealing with divorce. That's right. I did see Which that. I found so fascinating. Yeah, because she would have been, you know, in that older era of Hollywood. Or everyone Got married five times, <laughs> except for like Paul Newman. Yeah. <laughs> the outlier. Yeah. I can't imagine. Because it's, it's weird. I was thinking about that the other day. What what do you do as a famous person when you're going through something that is so unique to being famous? That's, I mean, I'm sure that's why all celebrities are just friends with each other because other people don't understand. But where do you find a therapist that knows how to talk about it? Because it's so like specific. Yeah. So I think that that's interesting that there was the need for that kind of group. I totally get it though. Myrtle Vale, who is the best in this. She's Seymour's mom. Oh yeah. The hypochondriac. Literal vaudeville actor. Her Wikipedia. She is a vaudeville actress (laughs) and she is so fucking funny in this. You probably, you wouldn't get married until you bought me an iron lung. You've been breathing for years, Ma. Well, it ain't easy. It ain't easy, son. She is drunk as fuck this whole movie. <laughs> yeah, and she's drinking like cough syrup. She's, she's, she's robo tripping this, this whole movie. Yeah, she. I think Seymour brings home a bottle of cough syrup. Dr. For her. Slurp Saddle or something. Yeah, she goes, what is it, 94 proof or 98% something? Percent 98%. <laughs> yeah, so she is, yeah, tripping balls this whole movie. But she also, she, Aud- or Seymour brings Audrey over for dinner and. She oh makes God. like what is it? I have it written down. Yeah, it's uh cod liver oil and sulfur powder. Oh my god. <laughs> this family's just and Seymour's all about his mom's cooking and so it is the weirdest little runner. But yeah, like, and her character's left out of the musical, right? Yeah. She's not present at all? No. Uh he cause Seymour is oh, he's an orphan. Like, yeah. Yeah. So he's actually and he's gets taken adopted. in by Mr. Mushnick. Mm. Yeah. It's also funny at the end when Seymour's getting an award and they have yes. everyone come to the shop all dressed up and she's dressed like a fucking flapper. Yes. Because that's what she... That's what she... Like in her youth would have been dressing up as. Yeah, I'm trying to think <laughs> the equivalent now is maybe uh, an old woman dressing... I'm trying to think how old would... Uh, it would like be like 70s six, 60s. fashion. 60s. Yeah, I think, you know, if... Dressing maybe Mad Men style mm-hmm. would be the equivalent, I guess, for an older woman. But yeah, that's so weird. Then you realize, whoa, that's how long ago this movie was made. And yeah. she was young during the 20s. And she <laughs> looks great. She's got the little feather headband and stuff. Yeah, she's so fucking good. Uh, then we have... <laughs> like okay, she calls herself a sea hag. Don't look at me. I- I'm a terrible sight. I- I'm a complete sea hag. She has... um. 
What's the the house mom in Black Christmas? Oh yeah, I forget, I forget what her, her name, name is. But she's fucking awesome too. That's kind of. I think if your movie has this character type in it, I'm gonna like it. You know. Yeah. Just older women who don't give a fuck and anymore. Who also should be played by Betsy Sodaro in any remakes. <sighs> oh my god. <laughs> Actually, though. <laughs> uh, next is Karen. Is it? Who- cups in it oh god this is uh this is that one actress huh yeah but as tammy windsor here's the thing you told me that's that's her uh, i guess tammy windsor yeah yes not her character name yeah as it's karen as tammy as shirley shirley's the character she's one of the two teenage girls who has like a two thousand dollar budget for their uh homecoming parade float no it's the it's the rose bowl parade oh okay because this it's weird this version takes place in california like it's clearly la area because they're talking about the rose bowl and stuff but it's so it was kind of weird to me because i just always associated this musical and the story with like either New York or even Baltimore because it just feels like a John Waters-ish type oh, universe yeah, thing. Does. But it's because they talk about snow and stuff in the musical. Anyway. Well, this- yeah, I guess uh, I guess he does say it takes place on Skid Row. Like the shop is on Skid Row. Yeah. And the dentist is on Skid Row. It's so funny. The movie opens with like a drawing of a bunch of buildings, uh, apparently Skid Row, and it's like panning across the the drawing and there's a narration by it's, the cop it's dragnet it's like literally dragnet it's oh yeah that, yeah that dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's but the, the cop is like this is my beat and i'm just like what this this 2d street yeah this <laughs> this musical theater length street so it's like three stores <laughs> yeah. uh but anyway yeah so karen coopsinet coopsinet fuck i don't know how to pronounce it is yeah one of the teens with this two thousand dollar budget for flowers i uh got out the old inflation calculator because i love doing shit like this what do you think how many dollars worth of flowers is that now from 1960 2000 to, yeah dude, to, that's gotta be like at least eight thousand it is at least eight thousand what do you think though oh uh okay then maybe Eleven thousand. Seventeen thousand three hundred thirty-five dollars. No wonder Mr. Mushnick was like, hmm, just do your business here, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh but this actress, and you told me when I was starting research for this, what did you say? What did you say? Basically did- have fun with this. Yes. Cause I did a brief glance at like the the cast and I saw I just clicked on her link and was like, why is this like teenage character have a link on wikipedia because her her friend the actress who plays her friend does not it's you know Mm -hmm. just uh some random person no you click on that link and i think in the opening paragraph it's mentioning the jfk assassination guys yeah so james said have fun she is maybe linked to the jfk assassination so i said oh boy i'm (laughs) i'm excited but I barely took any notes on her because I started reading into it and was like, oh, no, this is the whole thing. Too much? I can't just recap this. It was so much. What? She was found dead. She was, It was ruled a yeah. homicide. After the assassination? After like the assassination days after? of JFK. Yeah. Okay. Like right after. And she was the daughter of, shit, I forget if it was a senator, someone where, you know, they would have been. And this was, you know, that was 1963. This movie was 1960. She was 22, 23 when she died. Yeah. Because she's like, I think she's a 19-year-old in this. Mm -hmm. So, oh, you don't know? You got nothing for me? I just, I I looked at it. I did a cursory glance, and I just was like, this is, I'm going to get so sidetracked. I know myself. I'm going to get sidetracked and do a ton of research on this and none on Little Shop. I need to do research on Little Shop. Oh, no. But, yeah, check that out if you're curious yeah but it's i think it's her dad was a politician in some capacity i don't remember specifically and so there was some i don't know man i don't know if it's a thing where she was involved with jfk or you know like maybe she would have known i don't know i don't know i don't know but she was murdered she like was it murdered, was ruled sure. a homicide as a very young woman unfortunately yeah. and then it's weird who knows man yeah i know all about the lincoln assassinate because that one's easier to get my hands around it's older and simpler Mm -hmm. but jfk you know that's a lot of shit it's a lot that's a lot when we went to dallas for 
Texas Frightmare, right? Mm-hmm. That's Dallas. We went and saw where he was assassinated. Like, yeah, we they went. have like an X in the road where yes. where he was. So we went to shot, the, like man. the book depository and stuff. And there are people there who we went at night, so we unfortunately did not see any of this. But I guess during the day, if you go, there are people who they make money offering t- like conspiracy theory tours. I was real sad we did not have time to come back and I'm do fine that. Not giving them money. I'm fine giving them money. It's it's a uh, infotainment for me. <laughs> yeah but it was great because when we got there our we we took an uber over there and our driver was like oh you're going to see where jfk was shot and we're like yeah he's like here hold on and he pulls over and he gives us a fucking walking tour of that whole area so we gave him a really good tip because yeah. it was great but yeah dallas you're wild i love it that was fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so who else do we have here? Oh, I don't know if I have any notes on anyone else except... Except a little guy named Jack Nicholson. Yes, Jack Nicholson. 23 years he, old. But it's so... he Jack Nicholson is such a weird looking younger dude that you could have told me, yeah, he was 40 in this. And I'd be like, mm-hmm. Well, he, it's weird because he... He looks like a guy who you would be like, oh, you kind of look like Jack Nicholson. In the, yeah. In this, it, yeah, he looks like a guy who looks like Jack Nicholson. Yeah, he doesn't this, like, yeah. like, he looks like Jack Nicholson, but he doesn't look exactly like Jack Nicholson. He isn't fully <laughs> bloomed Jack Nicholson yet. No, no, he's still gestating it's a little. so <laughs> bizarre. Yeah, he plays this guy who... He he's one of the dentist's patients. And yes, the dentist is in this. The dentist is not just from the musical, although the musical makes the dentist Audrey's boyfriend. Oh, so we have more of a reason to dislike him because he's an abusive boyfriend. OK. And he's played by uh, Steve Martin. And Steve me. Martin. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But here I don't know the guy who plays the dentist here. But he's, he's so funny. He's, he's very funny. He gets into a little sword fight with Seymour with his dental tools. That is kind of fun. But uh, his whole thing is like he purposely causes his pain so i'll have this one and this one and that one and i have to have this one it's Seymour. only one two simo who is the dentist here you or me are you practicing dentistry without a license no and that's fine for jack nicholson because he's there Ooh, he likes it he he's reading the pain. pain magazine which is <laughs> readily available in the lobby of this dentist yeah yeah and it's just this extended sequence of him reading things from pain i didn't think his role would have been this much i thought it was going to be a little walk on and that's it the patient came to me with a large hole in his abdomen <laughs> caused by a fire poker used on him by his wife. <laughs> He's reading out loud from Pain Magazine, and then he insists on seeing the dentist. And at this point, Seymour has basically knocked the dentist unconscious no, or is he's he killed dead? him he has he killed, killed him. him with just like the tiniest swipe of a little dental oh, okay tool. so it's he's really dead funny. at this point so then seymour pretends to be the dentist and just yanks out a bunch of jack's teeth <laughs> yeah but it's so funny when you google this version of little shop so many home releases of this just have jack nicholson on the cover really yes i'll i'll show you some but it is to the point where if i was jack nicholson i would be like Please don't. Like, please <laughs> stop. I'm barely in this thing. Because it literally, it'll, it's like Little Shop of Horrors, and it's just Jack Nicholson. And you think, looking at these covers, that Jack Nicholson is playing Seymour or something. But he's not. He's just this random side character. It's so weird. Yeah, I guess might as well. I, I guess, you know, make some money. People think Jack Nicholson's in it. Yeah. I guess if you're working in advertising for the, this movie's home release. I guess sure. Nicholson said that uh, Roger Corman originally didn't want him, so he, he was purposefully very quirky. So, <laughs> so oh, I just really? did a lot of weird shit that I thought would make it funny. <laughs> I didn't realize that because I, I didn't read that part. He wasn't, Corman didn't want him originally. I guess. Uh, it says at the time of shooting, Nicholson had appeared in two films and had worked with Corman as the lead in The Crybaby Killer. Okay. Yeah, but oh, is that from Wikipedia? That's what I'm reading. That's from fascinating. It. Yeah. That's fa- I I love knowing that he wanted this. Like he wanted to be in this and He's, do it's this. A, role. It's a funny little role. It is. Yeah, and he is giving it his all. <laughs> I forgot that that character in the '80s version. So we have Steve Martin as the dentist, and Jack Nicholson's character is Bill Murray. Oh really? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. We should watch the 80s one. It's very I know, good. Now I want to watch the that. The one thing I don't like about it is the ending. They change it. 
Mm, is it happier? It's a happy ending in the 80s one. Oh, because in this one, Seymour gets eaten. Mm-hmm. By... That, as it should end, I think. Yeah. He's got to be destroyed by his creation. Exactly. That's how the musical does it. Because the musical, it's an allegory for fame. Mm-hmm. So everyone gets eaten by the plant, and the musical implies it's the plant's going to take over the whole world because the equivalent of the flower society in this one, the like, what are they called? The, the silent flower watchers of uh, oh, yeah, that's Pasadena or whatever yeah. the fuck. Basically, the equivalent of those people come in in the musical and they take a bunch of clippings from the plant and they're like, we're going to sell all these and become super rich. Oh. So it's just Audrey's everywhere. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, they're the ones who are given Seymour an award at the end of the movie. Yes, it's a... Uh... I guess they're kind of like the Academy in this. I would like to watch the colorized version. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see. I'm I, using I still a... don't fully understand how colorization works I and don't... how accurate I don't either... it is to the colors that were there when they shot. That's a whole... So I love looking at colorized photos and I've t- like tried to teach myself how to do it because I think it's really interesting. And I think there is a benefit to it in that, especially like really old colored photos. You You inherently, I think, have a little bit more connection to the subject of the picture when they're in color because it's easier to picture them as a real person but it is a subject of controversy because especially again with older pictures you don't know what colors things were you're you're essentially creating an alternate version of the history depicted in that picture because you're basically becoming an artist at that point and you're just guessing and picking what you think looks best and what you think maybe, you know. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't know how colorizing a movie works because coloring a picture is one thing, but because it's one literal frame, but I don't know how you colorize a movie and have it look good. I don't know how it works. Yeah. I I would love to watch a video of how colorizing film works like that. uh, uh, I think Peter Jackson did that colorized stuff for the smithsonian oh uh, like yeah like world war one and yeah he did yeah yeah i just want to like how the world war one, you, yeah. i guess you have to have weta do it because it's hard mm-hmm. you know like if you have <laughs> weta then you can go colorize all your footage i don't know but i think i, I used a and if, if i didn't change my mind at this point i used a still from the colorized version for this thumbnail <laughs> because okay, yeah people are less likely to click on black and white yep that's true mm-hmm <laughs> Oh, you, you know, I do have a, a random thought. I, being more unfamiliar with the musical version and just the property of Little Shop in general, I always thought that the plant, that its vocabulary was restricted to just feed me. Oh, no, me he's Seymour. talking up a storm. He's talking up a damn storm, man. Isn't he voice? Isn't a, he's, yeah, voiced by the writer. Yes, Charles B. Griffith Charles voices B. Griffith. Uh, the plant who's saying all sorts of things. Uh, and then if Charles B. Griffith also plays the random burglar who breaks into the flower shop mm-hmm. one night while Mushnik is attending and watching over the plant and then gets fed to the plant yes. by Mushnik. And that part, that's another random thing where I was like, oh, that's kind of in the musical. It is cool to see how they condense this movie and they take they take things from the movie and just kind of twist it around a little bit to make it more, I think, streamlined for stage because this robber character is not in it but instead uh so he seymour tells the robber or is it mushnik who tells him you just have to knock on it i have the money in there you just knock on the plant it'll open up Mm -hmm. there's some money in there in the musical it's seymour who tells mr mushnik you gotta knock on it does he He, kill mushnik he does (gasps) yeah what Mm -hmm. oh wow yeah seymour rick moranis does Mm -hmm. wow and he gets to live who, Seymour? Seymour? No. Oh, in the musical? No. Oh. Just, same thing happens. He jumps into the plant with a knife and is like trying to kill it from the inside, but he doesn't. But well, how's it a happier ending? No, oh, no, sorry. In the in the movie. Oh, you're right. Yeah, the movie. Oh, I'm sorry. So you're talking about the stage I'm talking musical. about the, like, the stage I'm version. sorry. This is kind of like a Rocky Horror type situation. Yes. It starts as a... Starts as a musical, becomes a movie, and it's also... A musical. I guess it's not quite a Rocky Horror thing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very confused. So wait, in the movie musical, the Rick Moranis movie, does Rick Moranis kill Mushnik? I don't remember, but okay. if it's an adaptation of the musical, yeah. Oh. 
I know. That's mean. But also, Mr. Mushnick's kind of a dick. <laughs> kind of. He's not very nice. He's not as bad as Seymour. Well, I guess he's meaner. Yeah. But I Seymour's also do, more culpable. I do love the way the musical changes how the dentist dies, too. That's such a creepy scene. So in this, we have that little fight with the drills. Right? Yeah. And in the musical, the, the dentist has a whole song, which we get a little bit of that kind of proclivity in this one where the dentist is like eating his his filling mix he's like i have this easy easy mix filling stuff it's like the silver fillings Mm -hmm. he it's like a powder that he mixes up and he's kind of licking at it it's really weird but in the musical he has a similar addiction to the gas the laughing gas That's right Mm -hmm. i do remember that yeah and so what happens is he basically has a whole setup where it's like a thing he puts on his head so he can huff gas and get high and he gets it stuck on his head and see more just is like hands off he lets him just oh yeah wow just die there with the gas thing i think it's so fucked up i love it am i correct in remembering steve martin on a motorcycle oh yeah absolutely okay. he drives he rides a motorcycle he's got the leather jacket because that's before you know he's a dentist oh because he's like <laughs> dropping audrey off at work and he's being an asshole and he's strutting around with his leather jacket and then that's when he he starts singing a song about how when he was a little kid he killed puppies and was like a sociopath and that's when he like rips off his jacket and he's a dentist oh man now i want to watch this movie let's watch it, let's watch it. <laughs> it's so good but yeah this one is uh the way that seymour's feeding the plants it's a lot of like random people that he just happens to be around for them dying although it's a lot of oops i hit this person on the head with a rock type <laughs> stuff yeah and one of them we learned is my former detective i keep forgetting that the detectives are even in this i know because it's like they have that framing device because like i said it opens with a guy being like this is my beat it's isn't that detective joe fink i'm a fink i'm a fink <laughs> i think one of my favorite little bits in this though is i uh i think i think one of the the cops is talking to seymour's mom who is a hypochondriac and she's asking one of one of them like oh do you know like oh do you know what you have or something because she just assumes that this guy is sick and he goes just the facts (laughs) ma'am oh yeah there is even a scene where they the detectives meet in one of their offices and it's just a really funny back and forth like really truncated dialogue yeah because i guess one of their kids just died because he was playing with matches or something and it's just like well them's the them's the breaks pretty yeah, much yeah the breaks. yeah uh also another similarity to bucket of blood there are two detectives in that yes, movie that's right. and one of them gets killed and the other is like the other who's like wears a bathrobe or something is like chasing after him right right Oh, yeah, uh, the, the railroad detective gets killed. The detective who's, like, at the railroad because I think Seymour goes out and he's all like, oh, shucks, my life is hard. And he, like, throws a rock and in this hilarious shot, it's, it's at a railroad, really good. this random dude pops up and the look on his face <laughs> is so fucking funny. And then he gets hit in the head by a rock that Seymour threw and stumbles in front of a oncoming train. And so he gets killed and Seymour ends up feeding him to uh, the plant. But like his the look on his face when he pops up. That is guy so funny. That guy to me looks like not Duck from Mad Men. Who's the other uh shit? Oh yeah. Because there's the, Duck, uh, the Murray brother. Freddie Freddie Rumson. Yeah, That's Freddy what Rumson. this dude looks like. It looks like Freddie Rumson <laughs> yeah. down at the fucking railroad tracks and gets hit in the head by a rock and then also there's a sex worker that is trying to seduce seymour and she's hilarious she basically can teleport and i for what is her name i wrote it down because she says it a whole bunch oh yeah she introduces herself and she's played i'm leonora clyde (laughs) (laughs) and she's played by the real life wife of the guy who played mel wells or I'm sorry, of of Mel Wells, who played Mushnick. Yeah, so okay. So that's Mushnick's real life wife. Yeah, but she's so funny. She basically just teleports over to where Seymour is and is trying to, to... get his attention. Yeah, and doesn't she like drop a banana peel? Yeah, in she front literally. Of him? At first, my my dirty dirty mind went to. I thought that because she, she's trying to get Seymour to like pay her. Yeah. For sex. Yeah. And I thought she was just finally resorting to peeling a banana and, and like, like deep throating it. it. Like, look what I can do. But no, it's, she drops the banana peel and gets him to slip. slip so she can help him up. Yeah. What, what ends up happening to her? She, so what happens is she, Seymour's thinking, oh, okay, I could, she really wants to come home with me so I could use her as food for my plant. And, but he, I, I think he gets all nervous and he's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to go to your place. And, and, 
they decide to flip a coin, but he doesn't have any coins. So he picks this rock up off the ground. And again, it's another just giant boulder. And he licks or he spits on one side of it and he goes wet or dry. And then she she goes wet. <laughs> <laughs> so he flips it and then fucking hits her. Like it just bonks her in the head. Yeah. Yeah. It's just lots of <laughs> these four strangers that kind of fall into Seymour's path. I do appreciate how the musical streamlines that a bit more so the the people that he's feeding to the plant you have some kind of emotional connection to yeah it's and, more intentional and it's more of a descent from like it's like justified quote you know where it's mm-hmm. the dentist and he's abusive to Audrey and is a bad person and then it's we're getting weird we're getting gray because then it's like mushnick and then it's like eh. you, I think it's a bit of more of an emotional payoff yeah instead of like random detective a random guy at railroad tracks who ends up being a detective because when those other detectives are talking they're like the railroad people just lost their best detective it's like <laughs> what? wait what I'm sorry they're the railroad yeah railroad <laughs> detective yep it's a train <laughs> case solved <laughs> and then yeah the robber at the store too mm-hmm. so it's like we don't really feel that bad about... yeah they're like introduced killed in a humorous way and then fed to i the guess client. leonora didn't do anything she didn't do anything but she's not a person we have an emotional attachment to as a character mm-hmm. yeah i love how the plant in this and it's funny because even in the shitty transfer we had i'm like this thing looks so shitty i love it <laughs> but then you look at it in the high res transfer and it is like a it looks like a high school's <laughs> version of audrey 2 that they made for their musical it's like kind of paper mache looking and has a lot of like just craft store moss like fake moss in it and all these little papery looking flower buds it's a lot of fun mm-hmm. yeah well hey they had to shoot it fast I think at the end, after basically Audrey, the person, is like, Seymour, you're weird and you're being weird and I we can't date and everything is falling apart. So Seymour goes, fine, you want to get fed, I'll feed you. And that's when he jumps in with the knife and basically takes both of them out at the same time. Yeah. And is that when we get the reveal? Oh, no, it's earlier that the flowers bloom on Audrey that's Jr. Because right, and- that's what they're waiting for, too. Yeah. The award ceremony. They're waiting for it to bloom. And uh, it does. And in the flowers are the faces of the victims. Mm-hmm. And so at the end, after Seymour jumps in there, I think the, the last shot with the end superimposed over it is the flower blooming it opens his up face. And he says, I didn't mean it. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, he's talking. <laughs> yeah. I love how abrupt that ending is. It's really good. I mean, it's just like, yeah, bucket of blood. It's, they bust into his apartment. He's hanging there. He, he hanged himself. And yeah. it says the end. The end. Yeah. We don't need any more. It's yeah. a short movie. It's a short movie. Like I said, it's 72 minutes. So it's a quick little watch. It's free on YouTube. Our, oh, it's uh, there's a Rift Tracks on it <gasps> is there really i think so where do you see that i'm looking uh oh no i see the dvd included an audio commentary track by michael j nelson oh that's good i see and Ooh. it's available as, as part of nelson's riff tracks on demand service i i'm gonna have to have, oh wait no there is it It says a newly recorded commentary in 2009 by mike kevin murphy and bill corbett uh, was released by Rift Tracks. Oh, ooh, I want to check that out. Yeah, that'd I be bet fun that to... that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I guess you know, as with everything, there are rumors of a remake. One in 2009, they were talking about it, and I guess again at the end of 2016, they were talking about doing a revert remake. But that always that happens, always. Man. Yeah, whenever you see stuff like that, just hold your horses just wait until something just goes into production i don't even get that excited about yeah. it because i think you look at any old movies wikipedia and there's some section where it's like a remake is in production by a blo- like, or like with killer clowns even when i did the kill count uh, over a year ago there were things on imdb saying a sequel's in the works it's so easy to type that and hit submit online but like actually getting a movie made takes so much more work. So until something's actually in production, like even when something's in pre-production, I'm like, I'll wait till the That's cameras the are thing rolling. Is you can have a ton of stuff in pre-production because like what is pre-production at a certain point? Mm-hmm. You know, you can be just talking about something in a meeting and count that as pre-production. Yeah. Yeah. Or I guess that might be development. Whatever. It just. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we'll see if we get another version. I'm sure at some point we will. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly, I wouldn't mind seeing another movie version of the musical. I think that'd be kind of fun. Yeah. 
Why not? Especially now, I feel like so many more actors are like trained singers and uh, musicians in that capacity, you know? Yeah. I feel like that's nowadays, it's like a thing where you have actors who are really good singers. Mm -hmm. Although it, I think on the flip side, stuff in the 80s, you could get away more so with just casting Broadway actors. Like the actress who plays Audrey is like a Broadway actress. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was wondering why you hadn't mentioned the name of the person who played her. Yeah, and I'm just forgetting her name. And like that's so, that's so bad that I'm forgetting her name because she is like a Broadway actress. Broadway mm -hmm. people are screaming at me right now for not remembering <laughs> her name. But yeah, like she's actually a very good singer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, cool. I mean, Steve Martin's well, a singer too. He's not a Broadway oh, singer, yeah. but he's a musician. Yeah, literally, mm -hmm. like he plays in banjo band and everything. But yeah, I will. It, it, I think it would be hard though to make something now because th that movie is directed by Frank Oz, and mm -hmm. so all of the puppetry in it. So the Audrey Two puppet is incredible looking. I don't know if you could top it. I think it'd be so hard to, you know, I. I don't know. I can't see a, a modern version of that going the same route of like, let's spend the time to make all of these different versions of Audrey two that are practical and look. Yeah. There, there's one way that I wouldn't want a remake is yeah. a CG Audrey. Let's yeah. not do that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Little shop of horrors, fun little movie. Mm -hmm. Definitely worth checking out. Yeah. It's not too much of your time. Public domain, baby. Mm hmm. Is it still? Is it like still public domain? I, I don't like it know because I know Night of the Living Dead. They finally got the. But rights yeah, back. and that was like last year. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like finally we did it. <laughs> I think with that was it the Criterion release. It was like a. I now think it's, so. Yeah. Yeah. Also, uh, check out. We got to include links in the description of this. In Search of Darkness Collector's Edition Dead Meat version, yes. which is only available to pre order in the month of October. Yes. November 1st, you will not be able to pre order it. It is a 80s horror documentary. It's, I mean, it's got uh, everyone in it. Yeah. And then there, the, the thing that you can pre order in the link in this description is a collector's edition centered around dead meat featuring the two of us. With like extended interviews from us and uh, commentating on every year of that decade. So it's definitely something that was put together with love and care for the genre and for that decade of the genre. Yeah. And I'm so excited to see it. I haven't seen a cut yet, but I'm going to soon. And But like now is the time to pre-order it, okay? And you get a whole bunch of cool shit. I think there's a pin involved. And just, uh, yeah, so check out that to pre-order that. Very limited time, so make sure you do it. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Other than that, follow Dead Meat on social media at Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Carebeck. C A R C A. I don't know. I'm having so much trouble with that one lately. C A R E B E C C. Yeah, you got turned into a little song. C A R E B E C C. It's like the A A R D V R K from Arthur. From Arthur, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Twitter and Instagram, and if you want merch, deadmeatstore.com. Mm -hmm. And feel free to shoot an email to deadmeatpod at gmail.com. Yeah, I'll. Try and read it. We get lots of emails now. We'll try to read it. Uh, until next <laughs> week, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Meat Podcast. 